So anyway, compliments to the one who made that. That's beautiful right there. If you would, turn to the back of your bulletin. We have some announcements there. You can read through all of those. I do need to add the cemetery committee will meet for a few minutes after worship today. And also I need to add in on March 4th, next Saturday, um, the 250 years of Elizabethtown starts a celebration. And so there will be an event in Elizabethtown next Saturday, but it starts and it's going to be like a year long celebration. There will be different little historical events recaptured or reminded. Um, so start paying attention to that. Linda was telling us about that this morning, Sunday school. Also, um, she's doing the wreaths across America, and they're doing it a little bit earlier this time. They're, they're $17 for each wreath, and if you buy two, you get one free. But she needs the orders in as quickly as possible for, I guess that would be for next December. So that would be wreaths across America. And also, she asked us, if you get an email from her and Mo, this is a strange-looking email, there's somehow there's been some hacks going on with the emails. She said, if you do, I'll either get up with her or we'll send these emails to the Attorney General. They need to know about this. So, anyway, that will cover all of the announcements. On our, on our prayer list, turn to your prayer list if you would. We need to highlight some names on here that we're getting special prayers. Laura Singletary should be coming home today from what I understand, Faye. And so this will be good. So she's had a very active week at the doctor's office is the best way to say that. And so we And she's hopefully improving on this. Susan Marlowe Melvin is feeling a little bit better. She is home right now. Am I right on that, Becky? She's home right now, but she's got to go March 13th to the Mayo Clinic in Florida. And so we'll be thinking about them. Also, Mr. Bill um, is still experiencing some difficulties, and Rusty's there with him, helping him. And so we want to put Mr. Bill, make sure he's still on our prayer list, as well as be thinking about Rusty and Gail and the family right now. Also, Jane, did you do your doctrine this week? Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Yay. Well, good deal. Well, we're proud of that. Um, we also need to discuss, we put Carlos Smith back on our prayer list. Carlos has gone to move, live with his daughter now, and so I think he's been having health concerns for a right good many years. We want to remember Carlos this week. Also, Miss Eunice Dennis has also had some health concerns. We want to be thinking about her. And also a former friend from out um, our way, Mark Britt. Mark has um, had some serious health complications and um, he had another procedure done this past week. And so I would like to put him back on the prayer list and be thinking about him. And with that, let us worship.
This is the proof of God's great love, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin, praying first together and then in silence. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you. We have turned aside to go our own way. 
we have misled our bride. We see ourselves pure when we are stained, and great when we are spotted. We have failed in love, neglected justice, ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sins. Sanctify us by your Spirit, that we may walk in paths of righteousness for your holy name's sake. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hear then Christ's word of grace to us. Our sins are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> Our scripture lesson today is from the Old Testament. It is Genesis 2, verses 15 to 17, and chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. <coughs> He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not get die, for God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made loin cloth cloths for themselves. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On a warm spring day, there was an older couple and their grandson, and they were driving down a road that had a really thick tree coverage such that they could not see the sun. And their four-year-old grandson, Luke, who was sitting in the back seat, spoke up and he said, there's so many trees here, I think I'm in the Garden of Eden. And the grandmother's ears perked up when he said, Eden? Yes, Luke said, well, don't you know about Eden? She said, well, why don't you tell me what you know about Eden? And so Luke did, and he said there were, there were a lot of trees in the Garden of Eden, and in the middle of the garden, there was a fruit tree. And God told Adam and Eve not to pick the fruit from the tree. But then a snake came along, and the snake said, it's okay, you can eat the fruit from the tree. And they did. Luke then said, I would never listen to a snake. I would listen to God. Grandma, why would anyone listen to a snake? 
Reflecting on this sometime later, she said, I never told Luke that I had ignored God many times and listened to a snake. We all find ourselves at times tempted to listen to voices other than the voice of God. The poet and playwright Oscar Wilde proves an astute observer of the human condition by his famous aphorism put into the mouth of Lord Darlington, I can resist everything except temptation. And that is a problem, of course, because to be human is to live in daily proximity to temptation. So as we travel on life's journey, we can expect that there will be temptations along the way. The good news for us is that scripture has much to say about the subject. One scholar put it this way, he said, the Bible, if it is anything at all, is an essay in the genealogy of temptation. And so we look today at the story of the temptation of our Lord Jesus. And by doing so, we will have occasion to reflect upon the temptations we face and the way forward through those times of testing. Matthew chapter 4 records the account where Jesus is tested in the wilderness. Listen now for God's word to you. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. The lesson ends at the 11th verse. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. O Lord, we pray that you would speak to us in this place, in the calming of our minds and the longing of our hearts, by the words of my lips and in the thoughts that we form. Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, and Lent comes from an old English word meaning spring. It's not just a reference to the sprouting plants that are pushing their ways out of the ground from the season before Easter, but also in the words of an author, it's about the greening of the human soul. Lent is about growth through challenges. And someone suggested that we think about Lent as a a form of boot camp, a spiritual boot camp. Now, originally, boot camp was referring to military training as that recruits were prepared for service and combat. Today, we apply that term more broadly. If you do a quick Google search with the words boot camp, the first thing that usually comes up is fitness training programs, not for military, but for civilians. There are boot camps for all sorts of things, like cooking, and the list goes on and on. But basically, it is a time set apart for rigorous training. Even though boot camp programs are challenging, they are meant to prepare participants for whatever challenge they are going to face that lies ahead of them. And so maybe for us, Lent is meant to be a rigorous spiritual preparation 
for the challenges that we face in life. And so it calls to mind drills and exercises and disciplines. What will it take for us to be spiritually strong? We grow physically strong through resistance training, whether that's mechanical or the resistance, resistance from um, pushing against gravity. So maybe, maybe it's resisting temptation that helps us grow spiritually over time. It's repeated resistance to temptation. Now in the story, it's worth noting when Jesus faced his temptations. It was right after his baptism. At the end of chapter 3, we have the account of his baptism. And the very next chapter, chapter 4, Jesus is tested in the wilderness. Now, baptism was a spiritual high point of sorts. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And the voice of the Father was heard saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Incidentally, we heard those very same words last week in the story of the transfiguration. But after the baptism, it all begins. Right after that mountaintop experience, right after the experience of God's glory and his baptism, Jesus is led out to the wilderness by the Spirit where he is tested for 40 days by the devil. After great honors, we often experience great humbling. Even Jesus, after his experience of closeness to his heavenly Father, is thrust into a situation of temptation. So we can expect nothing less for ourselves. We want to believe that our proximity to God will inoculate us from the threat of temptation. We say to ourselves, if our relationship with Christ is secure enough, then we won't be tempted. But just the opposite proves to be true. No one had a closer relationship with God than Jesus. In the language of the church, we affirm the mystery of the dual nature of Christ. That while he was here on earth, Jesus was both fully human and fully divine at the same time. Despite his closeness to God, despite his union with the Father and the Holy Spirit, Jesus was still tempted. The temptation of Jesus is a kind of model, writes preaching professor Ronald Allen. In this model, the spirit-filled life of Jesus is the pattern for the spirit-filled life of the church. Just as the Holy Spirit led Jesus to be tempted by the devil, so the church can expect to be led to places of temptation and struggle. Fortunately, we are never left alone in these difficult places. Allen says that the text assures the reader that the Holy Spirit sustains the community in the face of such painful struggle. Now, the question for us is whether we will follow Jesus in resisting temptation or whether we'll give in to the devil through a thousand compromises. We begin to follow Jesus by taking a closer look at how he responded to these temptations with resistance. And the first thing the devil dangled in front of Jesus was bread. Knowing that Jesus was famished after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. If you are the son of God, says the tempter, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus was hungry. He had a physical need for food, and he had the God-given power to make rocks edible. But instead of filling his stomach, he said, It is written, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus here was quoting from the book of Deuteronomy in his reply, and in doing so, he's using scripture as part of his resistance plan. There is more to life than the meeting of physical needs, according to Deuteronomy and Jesus. Much more important is striving to live by the word of God. Since it was the devil who suggested that he satisfy his hunger with bread, Jesus had to resist. He chose instead to be nourished by God's word. 
Now, a problem for us is that our culture teaches us that our needs are very important. Tony Walter has written a book titled Need, the New Religion, and he points out that some psychologists describe self as a bundle of needs and divine, define personal growth as the process of meeting those needs. This is in contrast to the approach of the Christian church, which has long talked about dying to self and rising with Christ. Unfortunately, says Walter, the church has largely adopted the language of needs for itself. So we now hear that Jesus will meet your every need, as though God were simply there to serve us. Maybe Tony Walter has a point. Since when is God to serve us? We are supposed to be the ones serving God. Since when is Jesus there to meet our every need? We are challenged to give ourselves, to give of ourselves, to become more like Jesus. The emphasis we place on meeting needs has in many ways turned our relationship with God upside down. <clears throat> Jesus certainly could have met his own physical needs by turning a stone into bread, but instead he decided to live on every word that came from the mouth of God. Jesus showed resistance to this physical temptation by focusing on the word of God. He trusted God during his 40 days in the wilderness, just as the people of Israel trusted God during their 40 years of wandering. In all such wilderness experiences, God provides us with what we need for life. It may not be what we want, but God provides exactly what we need. Well, next, we see that the devil uses the word of God to try to seduce the Son of God. He took Jesus to Jerusalem and he placed him on the pinnacle, the highest point of the temple, and he said, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands. This was a Satan's spiritual temptation, and he used a portion of Psalm 91 to get Jesus to make a, a leap of faith and show the world that he was in fact the Son of God. Someone has said the devil can be devilish, especially when he uses scripture to lure lure the people of God away from God's will. At this point, the deck seems to be stacked against Jesus because Satan was pointing out that Jesus was God's son and that scripture promised him protection, which was true on both counts. But Jesus was suspicious of anything that pointed away from God, even a mention of his own special status and a verse from the Bible. It is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test, said Jesus. Again, quoting a line from the book of Deuteronomy that warned against challenging God to prove himself. Even those who are baptized and masters of scripture should resist trying to force God's hand. Although we might think that we know what God should do. Only God is master of his own will. At times we are tempted to believe that we will get healing because we prayed for it, get ahead because we've lived good lives, get justice because the wicked deserve to be punished. But we should never allow ourselves to put God to the test. God will be God. And God is not bound by our interpretations of Scripture or our ideas about how God should act. In Psalm 91, verse 14, the same psalm the devil quoted to Jesus, God says, those who love me, I will deliver. God promises to deliver us, but probably in ways that are beyond our comprehension. Finally, the devil tossed out a political temptation. 
He showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and said, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan saved his political power play for last because he knew it would probably be the most seductive temptation. If Jesus had said yes, he could have made the world a better place. Imagine the possibilities. He could have eradicated poverty and disease, eliminated warfare, and extended his loving influence across the globe. World domination has a very real possibility, and how much better would it have been for Jesus to extend his influence and his thought? The temptation to rule the world might have been strong for Jesus. The devil was offering him all the kingdoms of the world. But Jesus showed resistance, once again returning to God's word from Deuteronomy. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Most of us will never be offered anything so grand as the kingdoms of this world, But we all have our spheres of influence where we live and move and have our being. And sometimes it's tempting to think that a little moral compromise might be in order so that we can get ahead. Or to think the ends justify the means or that cutting corners is okay because no one's looking and everybody else is doing it too. At times like these, it's critical for us to remember what Jesus said and did. With each of the tests, Jesus responds to the temptation by quoting a passage from the book of Deuteronomy. And the reason for this is that the words recorded in Deuteronomy were proclaimed by Moses to Israel while Israel itself was still in the wilderness. Deuteronomy was Moses' final instructions to Israel before his death and Israel's entrance into the promised land. In other words, Moses' words in Deuteronomy represent Israel's final preparation for the future that God had prepared for it. Now, in this realm of reality, we face many temptations. No one is exempt, not even Jesus, The letter to the Hebrews says that Jesus was tempted in every way just like we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus succeeded where we so often fail. And so what he models for us is trusting God at his word. He trusted that his heavenly father had a future for him that was beyond anything that could be satisfied in the moment by giving into Satan's temptation. And because of that, he won victory over sin and death for us. So the next time you're faced with some temptation, some offer of instant gratification, think about what your life would be like if, instead of giving in, you decided to trust God and his word more than you trust the allure of the temptation. Do that often enough, and you will grow spiritually stronger. Do that often enough, and your life will change. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we thank you for the witness of Jesus, who resisted Satan's temptations, and who trusted your word. Help us, O God, where we are tempted, when we are tempted, to recognize your presence and to trust you and your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.
Now let us together affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us go now to God in prayer. Oh God, on this first Sunday in Lent, we remember the road to the cross that Jesus traveled for our sake and we confess our sin before you. We remember how Jesus lived and died for us and we confess before you what we have done to offend you and to harm our neighbors and ourselves. And so we pray, O oh God, that you would have mercy upon us according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions and create in us a clean heart. Put a new and right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. And sustain in us a willing spirit according to your word. Bless this day, O God, those around us who dwell in darkness, who are mired in a pit of guilt and sadness, and let them know your great love for them and cause them to reach out to you as you reach out to them. Bless those this day who suffer, whether because of their own sin or because of the sin of others. Bring justice to those places where there is need. Grant mercy and new life to all who require it. Move your people everywhere, O God, to even greater works of compassion and love, and give to all the saving vision of your Son, Jesus Christ. Bless this day, we pray, O God, those who grieve, and let them know your mercy and all your promises. Lift them from despair and grant to them the assurance of your healing and saving love. Bless those in our family, in our community, and those around the world whom we have named before you this day and who are listed on our prayer list. Touch with healing, O oh God, those who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit. <laughs> Be with the victims of natural disasters and violence and warfare. Come alongside them with the relief agencies that work so hard to bring relief and let us where we can support them. We pray for all of those entrusted with authority and responsibility and we pray for the leaders of our world, that you would guide them and direct them by your spirit to do what is pleasing in your sight. Be with us all, O oh God, as we make this Lenten journey. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, joining our voices together in the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. The ushers will wait upon you now for the morning offering. Let's pray. God of grace and truth, we thank you for Jesus' witness to the power of your spirit. Bless and accept this visible evidence of our thanksgiving as we offer these gifts and the service of our lives. As we embark on our Lenten journey, guide and strengthen us with the Holy Spirit to follow Jesus wherever he leads us. We pray in his name. Amen. <clears throat> 